Maturity requires dialogue. One of the main things I learned from my research is that you can't grow up and become a mature person without dialogue. I have learned that boys want to be taken seriously and that they crave discussion about issues of authenticity and selfhood. I thought that perhaps one of the challenges of my research would be the difficulty of getting kids to open up. But in fact, the difficulty is getting them to shut up. They have so much to say when you set the tone in the right way and you make it safe for kids to talk and you convey this idea that there's not a right and a wrong answer here but we're just guys walking our own truth trying to make ourselves clear to ourselves and to other people. Very powerful. Why can't we meet like this all the time? I included some quotes that kids have said to me in different countries that I visited because at the end of the second day of a school visit and I would say to boys, guys, that's my last question. I want to thank you for being here with me. It's time for us to finish. Nobody got up. Nobody got up. They stayed right where they were and wanted to stay in this envelope of safety and positive regard because for many of them, those doors have never been opened before. Every school ought to make time and space for these types of kind of connecting dialogues. It should be something that starts at a lower school level, an elementary school, and continues all the way through upper school. Does my real life reflect my beliefs and fantasies about who I am? That's the idea of strength and honor. In my newest book, I call this the Harry Potter effect. Real life is way too dull. Where are the opportunities for school-age kids to use wizardry to overcome evil, because I think they want to do that. <laughs> they're interested in that. That seems like a cool and important thing to do, and yet there is no place to actually do this. The stuff that we do is so banal. It's so incredibly boring compared to the stuff that Harry Potter does. Remember, part of the secret of Harry Potter is that you live in a world in which children have access to special knowledge that adults don't have, and so children have a sense of agency and power that adults need. They are equal citizens in this world. In this reality, they are equal citizens, and that's precisely how kids think about their life. They wish that people would not talk down to them, and wish that people, adults, whether they're parents or teachers, would not, te would not treat childhood as though it were pre-adulthood, would not assume that there isn't something important that young people know and want to have an opportunity to act on that knowledge in a meaningful and consequential way. I believe most men are unhappy with their work. I told you that the greatest fear that boys have about being an adult is being stuck in a job that makes them feel like someone that they're not. But I also asked them on the second day when we were very close and I knew I could ask them almost anything and we began talking about families and family relationships on the second day. I said to them, so by the way, what's your greatest fear? The second day I'm only meeting with kids in groups of six so it's pretty intimate, pretty safe. What's your greatest fear? And I was surprised at the consistency of what they said. The first part is this, a fear of failing myself, that I won't live up to my potential, I won't be as good as I can be, I'll somehow miss the mark. But the second part was the powerful part, and it's where they said this, am I a worthy son? Am I worthy of the love and the opportunity that's been given to me? Am I worthy of my parents? Am I really doing what I'm supposed to do well enough? They told me over and over again that the worst thing that can happen to me in my life is to go home and to see my mom or dad disappointed in me. I hate that. I'll do anything to get out of that. I can't stand that feeling. I just want someone to tell me what I have to do so that they're not disappointed in me anymore. I can't stand to feel like that. We should know about that. We should know about the incredible power of our disappointment. It is not bad to use shame in life. Because when you feel ashamed of someone, you are in a sense implying that I expected more of you. I believed in more of you. So it's not as though shame is a totally bad thing, but we have to use it judiciously. We have to be very careful about that disappointment. And what boys say 
everywhere in the world when they get into a jam and they're having difficulty, whether it's a school issue or a home issue is, I can accept the fact that I've made a mistake if you tell me how to get out of it. I need just not to be scolded. I don't want to talk about the problem forever. I want to know what do I have to do to make things right? And I think that's exactly true. I think that's what we should do with kids. That's what I try to practice in my office when kids have made a serious mistake is how to make amends. How do you get yourself out of this so that you get your head back above water and you can feel right about yourself? Who owns the meaning of youth? Along the way in my study, I asked a question. I said, if you had a choice between writing a complex and difficult book report and pushing a rock up a hill that required 110% of your strength, which would you choose? A lot of rockheads in the world, ladies and gentlemen. About 70% of boys would pick the rock. Why do you think that's so? Why would boys pick the rock? Definable. Pardon? The success is definable. You see what the end point is before you begin? Absolutely. If you're going to push a rock up a hill, when you look at the top of the hill, you say, OK, I'm done when it's up there. If you set out to write a book report, how do you know when you're done? Is a book report ever really done? You know, I mean, this kind of thing, right? It's like, OK. So it goes on and on. Like, I don't know when I'm done, you know? What else? What's the value of pushing the rock? When I said this to kids, I noticed a lot of kids started looking out the window like, you got a rock out there? You're going to go push a rock? Is this happening? It's too good to be true. Pinch me. Yes? It's a kinesthetic challenge. Yes, it's a kinesthetic challenge. It's, you're going to touch that rock. You're going to feel the weight, the mass of it against your biceps and your legs. So yes, absolutely. It's also, I learned from many kids, a performative challenge. They imagine when they're pushing the rock that other people will be watching and cheering them on. They're going to be stars while they're pushing this rock, right? What are the two most popular television shows in the English-speaking world among men? Everywhere that English is spoken, the two most popular television shows, they're both on the Discovery Channel. Do you know? Number one is Deadliest Catch. You could die doing that job. That's interesting. That is interesting. You could possibly die doing this work. I'm in. And number two is Dirty Jobs. These are the two most popular shows. And Mike Rowe is the host of both shows, of course. The former opera singer, Mike Rowe. Interesting. And he has been asked and interviewed, Mike, why are your shows so popular? And he would say what you have said, the job gets done. The job gets done. There are so many men in the world who feel alienated from their work because they're only part of a process and they never see the completion. This is also the essence of the great New York Times bestseller, Shop Class, A Soul Craft by Matthew Crawford. It became a runaway hit with men across the United States because this is a guy who had his PhD in philosophy and gave it up to open up a motorcycle repair shop and he explains why and suddenly kind of connects with men far and wide. So that sense that the task is completed, very important. What should we take from this? Should we assume that, OK, we've got to get rock pushing into an extracurricular activity in school? Every school needs a big boulder. That's not the idea, right? The idea is that there are multiple narratives defining the lives of boys. And if we pay attention to only one story, the story of academic excellence, we miss much of their psychology and we lose their motivation and their interest and their trust and their connection, we have to pay attention to the other stories as well. The way that the United States of America is set up now is you go to school and the main thing you're asked to do is sit in your chair and pay attention and not bother other kids. And so long as you do this, you'll get one of the existentially vacuous jobs that is life's reward. You're going to get one. If you'll do this long enough and jump through all the hoops, you're going to get one. But we never talk about the real interesting question, which is, what work might you do? I wish we would use the term vocation more than job or career, because those are adult, banal terms that have little resonance with young people. But the idea of vocation and calling is very powerful. the primary missing ingredient in the lives of young people, the thing that separates them from a sense of personal accomplishment, maturity, and resilience, the thing that was present in their lives for millennia, 
but which is almost completely absent in the lives of all young people now, is this. Purposeful work. That's the thing that's missing. Some type of purposeful work in your life. Kids are not tired enough. Their brains are tired, but they ought to be working hard at doing difficult things. My family comes from, the history of my, my ancestors come from the island of Nantucket. And in the process of doing research about my family, they were all involved in the whaling industry, not in very important kind of positions, but more in processing whale meat and blubber and so forth. But I learned in my research that at one point, the captains of whale ships were like 16 or 17 years old. Responsible for the lives of a crew and for captaining a boat halfway around the world and for an economy back home. And who is responsible for something like that now at 16 or 17? That is the crisis, ladies and gentlemen. That's the thing that's missing. It's not, you know, a more perfect education. It's not a more perfect kind of, you know, STEM curriculum. That's not what's missing. That might be what we kind of use to explain ourselves. We're so interested in competing with other countries. We have this incredible anxiety about not being as good as Asia and math and science, and we never will be because we don't have the kind of seriousness about succeeding in that way that most Asian kids do. My experience in Singapore is that I was there on an exam week when entire families stayed home to help kids prepare for exams. I have kids that come to me for academic coaching and in the midst of preparing for finals, they go to the Red Sox game, they go out kayaking twice, they go to a graduation party, and of course they have to have downtime. <laughs> I, it's a, I, I, well, we are not, we're not good at it. We are not good at it, and I think in many positive, re, positive ways or for positive reasons, we're not good at it. We are a more kind of diverse culture in some way. We believe in being more well-rounded in some way as Americans. But the cost of that is that we are not going to be that myopic to succeed in some of those very kind of molecular, on some of those very molecular priorities that other places in the world have been willing to make the sacrifices to be really good at those kinds of things. I think that we ought to embrace who we are. I, thought we, I think we ought to embrace our kind of cultural legacy of being kind of people who have a can-do attitude, who learn at a young age how to be responsible for others. One of the things that John Adams talked about in the early colonies in terms of what made a man valuable in the colonies was his usefulness. He talked all the time about usefulness. If you were not useful, the colony did not welcome you. You were not welcome to live in a community unless you could be useful in some practical way. This was a colony, these were colonies that had relatively few people with any sort of skill. And so to be a part, you had to be useful. We've lost a sense of pride in being useful, although I think young people, and especially boys, sense the value and the validity of that and are seeking an opportunity to be asked to be useful and to do some type of consequential, purposeful work. Sometimes people who have read my books or read my essays and things on this topic come to visit me from faraway places. They come and they say, we've been reading your work, Dr. Cox, and Jason is very interested in learning how to find some purposeful work this summer. And that is the first lie. Jason has no interest in this. <laughs> He's interested in his iPod and his phone and being left alone for a few months. That's what he's interested in. And so, unfortunately, when we're seeking just the perfect answer, we're reinforcing the narcissism and self-absorption of boys, the idea that there's some very special choice, unique and just right for you. That's not really the idea of usefulness, is it? So I say to Jason, Jason, this is an important decision which is gonna have big consequences for the rest of your life I want you to think long and hard about it before you make a choice. You have 10 seconds. And I look at my watch and count off the 10 seconds. Because I know from years of doing this that if Jason can't name it in 10 seconds, he won't name it in 10 weeks either. He's going to draw a blank. He's going to draw a blank. But does that mean he's not capable of this? That there's no, nothing of purpose or significance for him to do? Absolutely not. It just means that he should begin with the tasks that are available. Whatever has a sense of urgency and immediacy about it. As a father, I am all the time trying to invent these things for my own son. 
As a therapist, I'm trying to invent this for kids in my community. As a collaborator with schools, I'm trying to create these opportunities in communities far and wide. But we can do this. Part of the advantage of middle class, of having some affluence in life, is that you are no longer affected by a sense of urgency. But the disappearance of urgency also means the disappearance of excitement for many school-age boys. They want to be urgently needed to do important things. I have a strong bias toward hand-based purposeful work. But that doesn't mean that's the right fit for everyone. Lots of kids are doing things in offices that have special meaning to them, or they're doing entrepreneurial things. I was just in Dallas where kids are collecting eggs that they're selling in a Dallas farmer's market. The collecting of eggs and chickens has become a very big thing uh, in, a, in a number of different places. When my son was seven years old, I put him to work in my office. I made him a badge. I had it made at Staples. It said, Addison Cox, creativity specialist. And I said, Addison, I want you to wear this badge whenever you come to work in Dad's office. You're going to get a budget of $100. It will be your job to go to Toys R Us with me and select $100 of waiting room games, toys, and activities. You will not get $101, not even $100 and one cent. You're only going to get $100. I printed out a spreadsheet. I said, you have to have things for kids of both genders and of different ages. And one of the greatest times we ever had were the two or three trips to Toys R Us where there was this conversation about what am I going to get, Dad, and this is a big responsibility, and I'm not sure that I know the right thing, and we've got to be very careful and make a good decision. And on and on with a calculator in the store and so forth. Very powerful. To this day, when my now 12-year-old son has maybe had a difficult time and has spent a little time upstairs in his room and he comes downstairs, he's got the badge on. Remember, Dad? Remember when it was just you and me and you gave me this important job to do and there was status associated with that and it was consequential because there was money associated with it? So often we're fooled into thinking that, you know, boys really like activities that make money. Not true. The money is secondary. What they like are activities that have some consequence and effect on the world. And money is one of the main signifiers that your work or your task has had some consequence in the world. So when money is involved, it makes it more meaningful, but it's not the collecting of the money that is the main thing. It's the idea that you're being entrusted to make important decisions. You have an important and complex problem to solve. 10 second rule. Animals. One of the most surprising things in my research was how much boys talked about the value of animals in their lives. Animals are the most important thing that we never talk about. There are educational conferences all over the world all about technology and technology is interesting to boys but not more interesting than animals. They want all the time to talk about animals as though the cartoon animals that befriended them as young boys, that taught them right from wrong, that was the main source of moral kind of guidance in their life, doesn't matter in some way. As though boys could become boys without those cartoon animals. The first serious breakup that kids go through in their life is when they break up with the cartoons that have informed their moral reality. And they're staring at that cartoon one day and say, you know what? I just can't believe in this anymore. I can't believe in cartoon animals telling me what's right and what's wrong. Dad, can we get a dog? That's the question. Now we have to have a real animal. And so the importance of animals is because they represent freedom and approachability and vulnerability. Dogs. Boys talk all the time about the warmth of a dog, of the comfort of a dog, the acceptance of a dog, touching and stroking the dog after a difficult day in school. I'm, I am dead serious when I say schools ought to have animals just walking around and socializing with everybody. That's not a negotiable thing. I think we ought to have that. If there were a school somewhere in the country that could not attract students, if they simply had animals walking around and socializing, right away they would have massive applications. Everybody would want to be associated with that kind of a thing. That is a culture that boys can totally identify with. Sometimes we say about boys, you know, we say about a rogue male, a really bad actor, a difficult male, we say, what an animal. He is such an animal. 
And that is totally wrong. That's not how animals are. Animals are all about order and compliance, sometimes even in the face of death. They are not about acting in that kind of rogue way for the most part. So when boys identify with the order and the compliance and the herd mentality, if you will, of animals, I think they are connecting with their kind of boy nature. There is something powerful about that and something really appealing about animals in that sense as well. One of my favorite quotes from the study, boys are boys, girls are girls, chickens are cool. <laughs> you know? So I am not kidding when I say that chickens are really elevated in status and boys everywhere are talking about wanting to take care of chickens, collecting the eggs, selling the eggs, cooking with the eggs, all of this kind of purposeful stuff. I love it when there's an entrepreneurial part to it. They're making money, they're producing something that other people want. In my early work with boys years ago, I wrote a book with them called Strange But True Animal Facts, which we produced and sold at local businesses to raise money for a local animal shelter. These were all kids who had been identified as difficult, poorly behaved, non-compliant kids at school who eagerly joined this process. Why is it that kids who get adjudicated and are required to do community service involving some type of physical work love it. Love it. Don't want it to end because it is being supervised and you're doing something of consequence and something for other people and it feels very purposeful. This is an iPad, this is a leopard, an iPad has been around for about five years. Leopards have been around for about 60,000 years. A leopard is the same the day you come onto this earth and the day that you leave it. iPads in a few short years will be a kind of relic of the past that we will remember with fondness but won't really need or use anymore. When I was in South Africa, I said to these boys, much as I did everywhere, I said, what does it mean to be a South African boy? And these were really young kids. I was in this group. They were like 11 and 12 year old kids. And this sprite of a boy sitting on my left, he was a tiny kid, but one of the smartest kids that I have ever met. I mean, when he opened his mouth, it was like, like Mozart. I mean, anything he said was just so eloquent and so insightful. I just was amazed by this kid. And he said, sir, he said, sir, you know, sir, what it really means is that we live in two worlds. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm here in Johannesburg. He must mean the world of black and white. That's the most obvious dichotomy here in Johannesburg. Or maybe he means the dichotomy of the haves and the have-nots. That's another big dichotomy here in South Africa. But that's not what he meant. What he meant is the world of technology and animals. That's what it means to be a South African boy. And I knew it as soon as I thought, there I go again, thinking like an adult. And it was such a beautiful moment, and the other kids immediately chimed in and reinforced what he had said. And I realized that all of these kids had had exposure to really large, wild animals. And so that's the way that they kind of, you know, divided the world. And so it's a, uh, an issue of permanence and continuity. That's what animals represent. A kind of permanence and continuity with the world that technology can never hope to achieve. It's not as though technology is not interesting to kids. It certainly is. But why do we discuss one thing ad nauseum and give almost no acknowledgement to the other? The transformative experiences young people hope for are related to being an exceptional child or teen rather than being an exceptional pre-adult. Being called to action elicits an adrenal response. It alters your perception of time, elevates your sense of duty, and makes you feel more important than your age. That's that experience. When I was in Africa, I said to kids, how many of you guys would be interested in kind of a life where you did something altruistic? You know, you really helped out other people. You worked for the common good. In a room of 12 boys, maybe like three, well, I guess I could be interested in that if I could live in San Francisco, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> My mother always said I'd be really good helping other people, so yeah, I would do it, you know, that kind of thing. Not exactly convincing. But then I presented the scenario, the head of your school has just said that the mayor of New York City wants six kids from this school to help with a crisis. You'll be working till after midnight and won't be you know, you'll be filthy, dirty, all that kind of stuff. You gotta be on time for school tomorrow. Everyone wants in. We need a sense of urgency, ladies and gentlemen. It's the urgency that makes life interesting. 
It's what propels boys through the difficult time. They will do the other things, but it's like strength and honor. If we forget the codes that make boys feel the way they want to feel about themselves, we have no right to be disappointed in their effort or lack of motivation or anything else because we haven't set the table. We haven't done the important work of helping kids to feel the way they want to feel about themselves. Being needed means you're going to have big memories. Modern children face an unfortunate fact. For all the love and attention lavished on them, hardly a soul takes them seriously. Despite abundant indulgence and protection provided to middle class children in particular, few are given anything significant to do because few adults believe there is very much they can do. And we're wrong. They can do all kinds of interesting things if those problems are put before them. And I know you might be thinking, but where do we fit it in? How does that happen in my child's life? He or she is already so busy now. And the truth is, choices have to be made. But we're long since past the time of making some of those difficult choices. Why is it that everything that we do is always focused on what's to come next, as though all of childhood is simply preparation for being an adult, and we lose the momentum and the power of really being engaged in your life when you're young. Whether that happens at school or whether it happens through a school, community, school, parent partnership, lots of different ways. I am now at work doing this type of work with schools, with communities, because I believe in this uh, to a great extent, obviously. But I found that often people want me to give a list. Here's the purposeful work I'm talking about. Here are the 12 things to choose from. And if I do that, I deaden the endeavor before we even begin. It has to start with more creative roots. It has to begin with a kind of dialogue, and kids have to be a part of that dialogue. What will you do to alter this narrative, which is really the question that I want to leave you with tonight, is what can you do as a parent, as a teacher, as a community member, to work to modify that alternative? How can you begin to have the discussion, whether it's at dinner, driving in the car somewhere together, where can you begin to engage the seriousness of childhood and really give kids that signal that we take them seriously and we believe they can do important things, which is what they really want from us. If you think that the main thing your child wants from you is unconditional love, I've got some bad news for you. Your child takes that for granted. <laughs> they are not home wondering if you're going to love them tomorrow. <laughs> That's in the bank. <laughs> I'm not even sweating it, bro. That's in the bank. <laughs> you kidding? They love me no matter what. But what they really want is to be held in serious regard. And if you want to know how you do that in the most efficacious, powerful way, it is with the tone of your voice. Your voice is more important than any other signal in conveying your regard and the seriousness. I've modeled for you my special way of talking with boys who feel vulnerable. And that's in part the foundation for that voice of seriousness. It's there in the opening scene of The Gladiator. It's there in the strength and honor refrain. I have used that, by the way, with more than 10,000 boys around the world. In other countries, it's common to do a school assembly, sometimes for 1,000 boys, before I address the faculty. And they have jumped out of their seats to connect fists and to say strength and honor. All day long it has gone on. It is a powerful kind of experience, so we have to find some way of setting that tone and talking about these kinds of serious endeavors and then rolling up our sleeves and getting to work at something. Something that is purposeful, something that you, it's not just a chore. Everybody does chores. I am for chores. We need chores to get a household running, to get a classroom running, to make a school work. But purposeful work is not chores. Purposeful work is purposeful and transcendent because it helps you to learn something about who you are as an individual. So in some way, it must be partially self-directed. It has to come in part from you because it's going to really reflect you and teach you about who you are as a person. But the very act of beginning that process with your son or your daughter makes all the difference. It's the same thing. People have said, is this all relevant to girls as well? Well, I have not researched girls, so in some ways, 
I don't know that I'm qualified to say with the same authority that I can talk about boys. But let me say this. Throughout my career, lots of people have brought girls to see me. And I'm thinking of a girl who came all the way from Texas with her parents. If you ask a 16-year-old girl, would you like to be a marine biologist when you grow up? She thinks to herself, what do marine biologists look like? Who do they work with? What's their workspace look like? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but if you take that 16-year-old girl the way the parents that came to see me did and put her on a boat in the Chesapeake Bay in boots and work clothes with no cell phone and have her work alongside other marine biologists collecting grass samples and teaching younger children about the ecosystem of the bay, in eight months she comes back so pumped about the idea of being a marine biologist she's out of her mind with excitement. She had no idea that the world was this interesting. It was this good, this good, that work can be so meaningful and purposeful and fun all at the same time and suddenly her perspective of school and the work that is required to do well in school and the long-term kind of result that you get from that hard work becomes crystal clear. That's another reason why this purposeful work is so important at a young age is because we lose the momentum of so many kids at 16 or 17 because they no longer can connect with any outcome that means anything to them. Kids are accustomed to thinking about your career or your vocation as though it's a buffet. I'll just step up and pick whatever looks tastiest to me. Maybe I'll do this. I can be anything I want. Utter nonsense. Pure nonsense. It's a recipe for unhappiness. It's a recipe for depression. By the time you are in middle school, you ought to be thinking about your calling and what you are uniquely well prepared to do. And when we talk to kids with a sense of seriousness about that, you can hear a pin drop. They love the idea. And they're all about some form of connection that will help them to understand that important knowledge about themselves and put them in that position for a life that is really fulfilling and happy and motivating and all the kind of stuff that we really want it to be. Um, these are my three books. Uh, this is the book that I mostly started to talk about earlier when I was talking about communication. And this is the one that I've just kind of spent most of the time uh, talking about tonight. I certainly hope that um, you found this talk interesting this evening. At the very least, if it's not interesting, <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm in the wrong business because it's got to be interesting for you to give me as much of your time as you did. I also hope that the talk in some way might have been relevant to your work as a parent or as a teacher. Even if both of those things are true, the privilege of this evening is all mine and I have known it from the beginning. Thank you very, very much for your time and attention tonight. Thank you. Thank you.